Only 20 years ago, the Asian financial crisis hit. In 1997 to 1998, Asia was hit by an economic crisis that devastated the economies around. Countries such as South Korea, Thailand, Hong Kong, Laos, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia were affected. But out of all these countries, Indonesia suffered the most. I have no idea at all why this is happening, really. Uh... It shouldn't be happening. Indonesia, a country where the sun shines bright. But in 1998, things got really stormy. Financially speaking, the U.S. dollar reached an all-time high at 17,000 rupias per U.S. dollar in January 1998 from around 2,500 rupias per U.S. dollar in 1997. And because of that, everything was more expensive, jobs harder to find, violence and demonstrations everywhere. But how did this happen? Was it bad luck or was there something more? Let's peel back the layers of this story. Imagine you're living your life, everything's normal, and then, out of nowhere, prices for things you buy every day, like food and clothes, skyrocket. At the same time, finding work becomes like searching for a needle in a haystack. This nightmare scenario was a reality for many people in Indonesia. But here's where it gets even more interesting there was a powerful organization, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF for short, that stepped in to help. However, some people say this help was more like walking into a trap that you can't easily escape from. The IMF gave Indonesia some money to fix its problems, but they also asked for changes that made life much worse for Indonesians. But before we dive deeper into how the IMF's involvement turned into a controversial chapter for Indonesia, I've got a small favor to ask. If you're intrigued by stories like this, then make sure to hit that subscribe button. Subscribing not only supports this channel, but also keeps you in the loop with fascinating tales from Indonesia and around the globe. So, subscribe now and let's go to 50,000 subscribers this month. Now, let's continue uncovering the story of Indonesia's economic roller coaster. <laughs> The period from 1989 to 1996 stands as a remarkable era for Indonesia's economy, showcasing some of the most impressive growth figures in the country's history. The exchange rate of the Indonesian rupiah against the US dollar was around 2,000 rupias per US dollar, reaching its lowest point at 1977 rupias per US dollar in 1991. The peak of this economic boom was in 1995, with an astounding growth rate of 8.2%. This period was characterized by sustained high growth, with the World Bank reporting an average annual growth rate of 7.3%. Since then, no future era has managed to surpass that achievement, even in the present day. Take a taxi ride in Jakarta these days and you begin a journey into the financial fiasco of Southeast Asia. This era of economic prosperity earned Indonesia the nickname of the Asian Tiger, positioning it as a rising economic power expected to soon rival Japan. To fund their Asian dream, Steady Safe borrowed 270 million US. As well, they had the gold seal of approval here in Indonesia. In the World Bank's 1993 report, titled The East Asian Miracle, highlighted Indonesia's achievements by including it among the high-performing Asian economies. This group consisted of eight countries that experienced rapid economic growth from 1965 to 1990, managing to double their real per capita GDP. This group consists of some economic powerhouses like Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia. This remarkable growth was accompanied by significant reductions in poverty levels and narrowing economic disparities, marking a period of substantial socio-economic improvement of Indonesia. Exploring further into this era, the manufacturing industry stands out as a top performer, as outlined in the extensive research by Von Zanden and Don Marx in their study, The Economy of Indonesia, 1800 to 2010. Between 1986 and 1996, 
This sector demonstrated an impressive annual growth rate of 11.3%, surpassing all other sectors. This trend was not an isolated occurrence. Various non-oil sectors of the economy flourished, benefiting from a deliberate strategy to diversify the economy beyond its traditional dependence on oil and gas. The remarkable progress of these sectors can largely be attributed to significant deregulation efforts and economic reforms introduced in the 1980s. These initiatives enabled the non-oil industry to achieve an 8.4% growth rate, while the oil and gas sector only managed a modest 1.6% growth. Investment patterns during this period also reflected Indonesia's growing economic confidence and attractiveness to foreign investors. Foreign investment surged from 4.7 billion US dollars in 1989 to 29.9 billion US dollars by 1996, underscoring the international investment community's optimism about Indonesia's economic prospects. Domestic investment likewise saw substantial growth, evidencing the local business community's confidence in the country's economic direction. However, during this time of economic prosperity, there were challenges to face. The rapid expansion and the inflow of foreign investments resulted in a notable rise in the nation's overseas debt, especially within the private sector. By 1996, there was a significant shift in the balance between government and private external debt, bringing about new threats to the stability of the economy. The mounting foreign debt, particularly in the private sector, lacking sufficient risk management strategies, laid the groundwork for potential weaknesses ahead. These issues escalated when Indonesia was impacted by the Asian financial crisis in 1997 to 1998, revealing the vulnerabilities lurking beneath the seemingly robust economy. And they found, you know, they could go to Indonesian companies and say, we can raise money for you for the rest of the world for so much less than you're paying your bankers now. And there just seemed to be no constraints. So they could go to a taxi company that earns money in rupiah and not a hell of a lot of it and say, we can sell your debt in U.S. dollars to investors all over the world. And it's so cheap for you. And it just seemed like magic. Because the world economy is so interconnected, restoring confidence and financial stability in Asia is very much in our long-term economic and security interests. That is why the President has responded to the current financial crisis by strongly backing recent IMF initiatives in Asia. The Asian financial crisis that took place from 1997 to 1998 started with a currency crisis in Thailand. Then it spread to several Asian countries, including Indonesia, and quickly shook the country's economy, which was already on shaky ground. The large amount of debt in US dollars caused the value of the Indonesian rupiah to fall from 2,500 rupiahs to 17,000 rupiahs against the US dollar. The crisis also led to a surge in Indonesia's inflation rate to 77%, while the economy contracted by more than 13%. Before 1997, Indonesia's economy was growing strongly, fueled by investments. However, this situation led private companies to take on more debt to finance projects, resulting in short-term and long-term private debt reaching about 157% of the GDP by 1998. Inadequate surveillance also exposed the Indonesian banking system to risk, given its significant control by a consortium of businessmen. This situation arose from Indonesia's 1988 implementation of banking laws, allowing the establishment of banks by individuals with a capital of 10 billion rupiahs, or 645,000 US dollars. This led to a surge in new banks and financial enterprises, both local and foreign. On May 1998, the combined foreign debt of 1,800 private firms was approximated at 63 to 64 billion US dollars, surpassing the government debt of 53.5 billion U.S. dollars. I think it's a circus. Circus? Yeah. I mean, uh, all these people standing around, watching the rate going up and down, trying to decide, should they buy, should they sell?
what's really upsetting is uh, you know all the all the headlines today. It's it's unbelievable actually. Like this one, the IMF package is not in line with the Constitution. So why did the president sign it? <laughs> I think people are confused. So, so am I. On January 15, 1998, President Suharto of Indonesia signed a new agreement in front of Michel Kamdesus, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, at Suharto's residence in Jakarta. This agreement outlined major reforms and cost-saving measures related to a massive bailout led by the IMF. The IMF promised to lend 35 billion US dollars to Indonesia, but only if Indonesia could meet many conditions. Push, then push, then push. Asking the IMF for help turned out to be a huge mistake by President Suharto. The IMF required various policy programs that didn't make sense and actually made the national economic situation worse. For example, the policy to liquidate 16 small banks ended up destroying public trust. People withdrew their money from national banks, causing many banks to collapse. On May 1, 1998, following the IMF's advice, the government increased the price of gasoline by 74% and kerosene by 44%. This led to massive anti-fuel price hike demonstrations in various cities across Indonesia, started from Makassar City on May 2nd, Medan City on May 4th, Solo City on May 9th, and eventually leading to massive riots in Jakarta in the second week of May 1998. The IMF was excessively interfered the sovereignty of nations, particularly concerning privatization and deregulation of foreign investments. In Indonesia, the IMF's interference extended to requesting political reforms as a condition for aid disbursement. This delay in fund allocation led other institutions to withhold their support, awaiting approval from the IMF. Balil Lahadalia, the Minister of Investment, said, In 1998, the IMF recommended that our industries be shut down, such as PT Durgantara Indonesia, and also requested that social assistance be stopped. As a result, people's purchasing power weakened, and life became harder for Indonesian. This was the beginning of Indonesia's deindustrialization, he stated in a press conference in Jakarta on June 30, 2023. IMF menentang kebijakan larangan ekspor karena menurut analisa untung ruginya yang dilakukan oleh IMF itu adalah pertama menimbulkan kerugian bagi penerima negara dan yang kedua berdampak negatif terhadap negara lain. IMF mengatakan bahwa negara kita rugi. Ini di luar nalar berpikir sehat saya. Dari mana dia bilang rugi? Tahu nggak, dengan kita melakukan hilirisasi, itu penciptaan nilai tambah itu sangat tinggi sekali di negara kita. Contoh, hilirisasi kita di nikel, ekspor kita 2017-2018 itu hanya 3,3 miliar US dollar. Begitu kita menyetop ekspor, ekspor nikel, kita melakukan hilirisasi, ekspor kita di 2022 itu hampir 30 miliar US dollar, 10 kali lipat. Hilirisasi itu bukan hanya pada konteks untuk menciptakan nilai tambah. Tapi hilirisasi itu dilihat sebagai bentuk kedaulatan bangsa. Jadi kalau ada siapapun yang mencoba untuk mengatakan hilirisasi itu adalah sebuah tindakan yang merugikan negara, itu kita pertanyakan pemikiran ada apa di balik itu. Persoalan uh, merugikan negara lain. ya. Emang saya mau tanya ya, Waktu negara kita rugi, negara lain memikirkan kita. Aku mau kasih tahu sama teman-teman. Kita pernah punya sejarah panjang 
ya tentang IMF. Tahun 98 ketika terjadi krisis ekonomi yang merekomendasikan resep untuk ekonomi kita kembali adalah IMF. Dia merekomendasikan pertama industri-industri kita ditutup. Contoh Dirgantara. Bansos-bansos ditutup. Akhirnya daya beli masyarakat lemah. Disitulah cikal bakal terjadi deindustrialisasi. Bunga kredit dinaikkan, hampir semua pengusaha kolaps. Kredit-kredit macet asetnya diambil. Apa yang terjadi? Negara kita lambat untuk menuju kepada pertumbuhan ekonomi. Di tahun yang sama, Malaysia menolak. Rekomendasi IMF Jadi malah justru saya menanyakan Apa maksud dari IMF Menyampaikan ini Indonesia Which had been becoming a new economic power in Asia Due to increasing industrialization Was forced by the IMF To deindustrialize Many of the IMF's recommendations Failed to address the economic issues and rather implied that external forces were influencing Indonesian government decisions. There was a clear interest from the United States in influencing IMF policies and using the IMF to pressure Indonesia and to overthrow President Suharto. Former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating believed that the United States deliberately used the economic collapse as a tool to remove Suharto. Later, after stepping down as the managing director of the IMF, Michelle Camdesis admitted to the scenario of overthrowing Suharto. In an interview with David A. Sanger, published by the New York Times on Wednesday, November 10, 1999, titled, Longtime IMF Director Resigns in Midterm, Camdesis said, We created conditions that necessitated President Suharto's departure from office. Suharto, who had been supported by the U.S. for decades, just as the President Shah of Iran was defended by the U.S. to suppress his own people, also fell tragically. The second president of Indonesia, Suharto, resigned from his position on May 21, 1998, after losing support for his presidency that had lasted for 32 years. Saya memutuskan untuk menyatakan berhenti dari jabatan saya sebagai presiden Republik Indonesia terhitung sejak saya bacakan pernyataan ini Pada hari ini, Kamis 21 Mei 1998. The overthrow of Suharto, with the involvement of the IMF and the United States, is what Indonesians refer to as reformation. Okay.